you bow your heads in a word of prayer with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, um, for your grace of promises and that's your presence. Thank you that your presence is among us this morning, Lord, and thank you, Lord, that you're um, with us even though we don't deserve it, Lord. And Lord, I pray you would guide us as we continue to worship you through looking at your word together. And Lord, I pray, Father, that um, you would, your Holy Spirit would illumine our hearts and apply the eternal word to, to our hearts and transform us um, in specific ways in each of our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. I really love that song. I'm sure a lot of you do too. It carries special meaning with me for a lot of reasons. One is it reminds me of my, my parents. But the biggest reason is, is I feel like I could have written that song. <laughs> I Ever since I've been, on, I've, I've said many times, ever since I've been a little boy, ever since I can remember, I've always remembered God's tangible presence with me, even though there's no logical ex explanation for it. And that's one thing that I'm trying with it, with every, whatever power that I have or don't have to pass on to my daughter. I feel like, I, I, I really believe that it's the greatest, one of the greatest gifts that I've been given is just to know that God walks with me and talks with me. So we went on a trip together over the last couple of weeks and it was, we had a lot of fun. Um, we were trying to um, have fun, but be safe and be respectable, um, you know, for lots of reasons, just, just for common sense, for all of you. I did a officiated a wedding yesterday. It would be terrible if I had to quarantine myself and ruin someone's wedding day. But so all along the way, we, were, we, we had a lot of fun with it and just doing common sense things. We stayed at my friend's church for a couple of days. We camped outside of my brother's house for a few days, which is a first for us. And, it, and all along the way, we were talking about God's omnipresence, not specifically to prepare for this sermon, but just because that's, that's what, what was what we were thinking about is bonding us together with God. Everywhere we'd be, I'd tell, we tell glory joy, Jesus is with us. All the, all the way along, every, every place we stayed, every, every road we were on. And then when we just come home, we were across the Colorado line, and we were listening to uh, K-Love or, or one of the Christian stations, and the emergency weather forecast broke in and said, there's going to be a huge storm with golf, golf ball-sized hail, wind gusts up to 60 miles an hour, um, now, whether that, that it didn't happen, but whether it was going to happen or not, my first thought was, I've been in hailstorms here one time before, and it was pretty loud, and it wasn't golf ball size. So I wanted to prepare glory and, and hope for, hey, if, if this happens, so I turned around to glory, and I said, glory, it might get really loud. I said, but remember, Jesus is with us, so we have nothing to worry about. And um, she really said, Jesus with us? And and so fast forward to yesterday after the wedding. Um, we drove two, two different cars, and Glory Joy wanted to come with me, but I didn't have the baby seat. And she says, is Jesus going with you? I said, yes, he is. Is Jesus coming with us too? I says, yes, he is. But he's still going with you? And I said, yes, and Jesus is the only one that, that, that isn't afraid of my driving. <laughs> have you ever tried to explain Biblical doctrine to a child. I know many of you have, and you've done quite well at it. It's, it can be tricky to translate complex theological concepts into words and images that children can understand. And honestly, most adults need the same kind of explanation as well. So this morning, we are going to be looking at God's, God's omnipresence. God's omnipresence. As you know, we've been studying God's attributes over the last number of weeks. You know, if you have a right understanding of God's attributes, if you have a, a, a proper foundation in who God is, then your worldview will fall right into place. You'll see things the way they should be. A.W. Tozer said that what comes into your mind when you think about God is the most important thing about you. And it is. If we want revival, if we want to persevere, if we want to see God do a work among us, then it's important that we have a right perspective about God and that we're continually focusing on who he is because God doesn't change. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. So allow me to give to you my the most concise definition of omnipresence that I, could, that I can come up with. The doctrine of God's omnipresence refers to his unique ability to be present everywhere 
simultaneously. God is able to be present everywhere simultaneously. You know, God doesn't have size or spatial dimensions. In fact, he created, he created space and time, and so he's the Lord of it. And if, and, and, and if you don't believe that he created space and time, just look at Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. He created it, so therefore he, he's not bound by it, and, not, and not, he's the Lord of it. So this morning we are going to look at three different biblical passages to show us three things about God's omnipresence. Three things about God's omnipresence. First, God cannot be confined to a place. God cannot be confined to a place. And thank goodness, because if he was confined to the sanctuary, we'd be in trouble, right? Most of you have probably heard the phrase, you can't put God in a box. Usually when people say that, they're, they're talking about trying to, to associate God and bind, bind human terms and human limitations on him in an effort to understand God. Well, King Solomon was making this exact same point about God's omnipresence in 1 Kings chapter 8, verses 25 to 27. And in, in that passage, it tells the story of Solomon delivering a powerful prayer to dedicate the newly constructed temple. There he stood before the altar of the Lord, before all of Israel, and he, he spread out his hands toward heaven. And he said this, Now, Lord, God of Israel, keep, your, keep, your servant, keep for your servant David, my father, the promises you made to him when you said, You shall not fail to have a man sit before me on the throne of Israel. If only your sons be care, are careful and all they do to walk before me as you have done. And now, O Lord of Israel, let your word that you promised your servant David, my father, come true. But then he says this, but God, but, but, but seriously, God, will, will you really dwell on the earth? The heavens, even the highest heaven cannot contain you. How much less this temple that I've built? See, Solomon was the, the Bible says he was the wisest of any man that ever lived, and he shows his wisdom here. You know, standing before a big, beautiful, glorious temple, the Israelites could have been tempted to, to associate that with God and think God was limited to that. Well, Solomon was trying to preempt that. Solomon knew that even though he had completed the temple, even though God's presence would fill the temple, and even though the, the people of Israel would come and, and worship at the temple, that there's no way God's presence could, be, could possibly be bound by a, a wooden and metal box. So he argues, he said, if the highest heaven can't contain God, there's no way that this man-made box is going to contain him. God is omnipresent. Unfortunately, many people today, especially including Christians, they, they, don't, they don't seem to have adopted Solomon's theology. They deny God's omnipresence by, by their actions, by trying to limit God to working only in certain places, at certain times, with certain people, and in certain ways. You know, if we try to contain all of God's activity inside the four walls of the church, or even in some, some canned format of worship, or on our religious calendars, then we, have, then we, we, have, we don't understand the true nature of God. Now, don't misunderstand me. There's nothing wrong with buildings. In fact, they can be quite convenient when, for weather, when you have a place to fellowship, when you want to have a place to do a wedding or a funeral, if outside is not available, of course. It, 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 there's nothing wrong with a building. But God's presence isn't, isn't in an ornate cathedral or, or some kind of beautiful basilica. It's not in those places anymore that it's in a hut with a thatched roof. C.S. Lewis, in his book, Letters to Malcolm, chiefly on prayer, makes this, a similar point when he says, it is well and it's good to have specifically holy places and things and days for, because without these focal points or reminders, the belief that all is holy and big with God will soon dwindle to be a mere sediment. But, he says, if these holy places, things, and days cease to remind us 
If they obliterate our awareness that all ground is holy and every bush a burning bush, then the hollows begin to do harm. See, God is omnipresent. So you could not possibly put God in a box. There's no way. Second, God's omnipresence, the presence of God, consoles us and reassures us. So you can't, not only is God so big, you can't put him in a box. He's, he's so big, he's, he's, in, he's everywhere. He's not part of creation. He's separate from it, but he's everywhere. But also, his omnipresence consoles us and reassures us. See, this, the, the doctrine of God's omnipresence, similar to what we looked at with omniscience, ha, has both encouraging and alarming ramifications for our lives. On the encouraging side, it can reassure us and console us during times of need. And in Psalm 139, verses 7 through 16, David praises God for his personal presence in his life. No matter where David goes, he says this. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up into the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise on the, on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me. Your right hand will hold me fast. If I say, surely the darkness will hide me and the light become, the light become night around me, even the darkness will not be dark to you. The night will shine like the day, for darkness is as light to you. For you created my innermost being and knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from, from, from you when I was made in the secret place. When I was woven together in the depths of the earth, your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. David, you, you can tell how, how intimately David knows God. He knows that God's presence will guide him and hold him and be his light, even when he goes through the darkest of time. I don't know if any of you have ever heard of Dallas Willard. He was a great Christian author. He passed away on May 8th, uh, 9, 2013, I believe. And he, 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 a biography was written by him, by a gentleman who was a close friend, and he was with Dallas Willard at the time. He said, that, and when it became to the last moments, he, Dallas said to him, he says, thanks for being such a good friend to me. And tell my family that I love them and I just uh, thank them for being in my life. He said, and then in the next moment, he turned the other way and looked to some, some, somebody, something that was clearly present and he said, thank you. And he closed his eyes and that was the last words he spoke to a, to a very real and present God who became fully present moments after that. That's what David says here. God created him in his mother's womb. God's presence was there when David was knit together in a secret place. Even before David was born, God's presence was with him and planned all the days of his life. And you know, it's just like King David, God's presence was with, with you when you were created. Sure, your mother and father did their part, but ultimately it's God who created you. I, I always remember when I'm going through uncertain times, this wasn't my idea in the first place. I, I, didn't, I did not have the idea to be born. God's presence was in your mother's womb. He knit your innermost being together in a secret place. He wove your unformed body together in the depths of the earth. He ordained every one of your days, even before you were born. God's presence has always been with you, even when you didn't know it. it makes me think of Jacob, who wrestled with God, and, he's, and at, the end of, at the end he says, God was in this place, and who would have knew? Uh, God, God's with you even, even when you didn't know it. And God's presence is still with you today. God's there to hold you when you are experiencing the pain of hurt feelings or a broken relationship. He's there to guide you when you lose your job and you're having difficulty making ends meet. 
He's right there to console you when someone close to you dies. And he's there to reassure you on those days when maybe something's wrong in your body and the doctor comes to you and says it might be cancer. God is omnipresent. And he's with you no matter what you face. How many of you might have doubts about God's presence with you? If you ever struggle with doubt about God's presence with you, just consider the examples that we have in Scripture. And here's just some of them. Do you ever have doubts about God's presence in your life? Think about how he preserved Noah and floated the, the ark on the floodwaters. Or think about how he strengthened Moses' bravery at the burning bush. Or just think about how, how God liberated Daniel from danger in the lion's den. Or just think about how God delivered Daniel's friends from the fiery furnace. Or think about how God preserved the Apostle Paul, who went through many terrifying tortures and persecutions in prison. Or just think about how God's presence sustained Jesus as the Roman soldiers nailed, nailed, nailed hammer nails into his feet and to his hands. Or just think about that your brothers and sisters around you, how, how God's presence has sustained them and how you can clearly see it. God's presence is with, with every one of them, and he's with us today. And yes, God's presence can certainly consoles us and reassures us during times of need. But there's a third thing. Third, God's presence brings conviction and yet great joy. See, not only does God's presence con console us and reassure us, but it also keeps us on our toes and accountable, if you will. A burglar once broke into a certain house, and things seemed to be going pretty well for him. He managed to get in without setting any alarms off, and it didn't sound like anybody was stirring in the house. So after surveying, he thought the coast was clear. No one was there. And as he said about his business of ransacking and robbing the entire house, he was startled when he heard a little voice say, Jesus is watching you. And he's even more surprised to see that it was coming from a parrot in a cage in the kitchen. He thought it was strange that a parrot would, would talk about Jesus, but he thought, hey, it's just a parrot, so I'm going to continue on with what, I, what I'm doing here. Well, the parrot said again, Jesus is watching you. And then he, at this point, he's a little bit disturbed, and, and honestly, his conscience was starting to bother him at this point. But still, he, he decided to keep, continue on because the bird's in a cage, and he's already in the house. But the parrot said again, Jesus is watching you. And this happened four or five times before, before the, the burglar was really surprised to hear the parrot say, Sick him, Jesus! And the burglar turned around to be face-to-face -face with a Doberman who was lunging at him. Yes, Jesus is watching you. But I don't want you to think of him like a Doberman. But yet, God's omnipresence should keep us accountable. If you know that God's sitting next to you, I think it should affect how, how you act and what you do. Well, this was the exact point that God was making to the northern kingdom of Israel through the prophet Amos in the, in the mid-700 B.C. In Amos chapter 9, verses 1 through 4, the prophet said this, I saw the Lord standing by the altar. He said, strike the tops of the pillars that the threshold shake, so that the threshold shake. Bring them down on the heads of all people. Those who are left, I will kill with the sword, and no one will get away. No one will, will escape. Though they dig down to the depths of hell, from there my hand will take them. Though they climb up to the heavens, from there I will bring them down. Though they hide themselves on top of, of Carmel, there I will hunt them down and seize them. Though they hide from me at the bottom of the sea, there I will command the serpent to bite them. Though they are, they are driven into exile by their enemies, there I will command the sword to slay them. I will fix my eyes upon them for evil and not for good. Wow, that's, that sounds rough, doesn't it? You say, well, how does a loving God, how, how can a loving God say something like that? Well, I'll tell you how. God was there. He was, he was present. He was present to witness their habitual spiritual corruption. He was there to witness their shameful, sinful attitudes. He, he was right there to, to witness the systematic moral decay of the northern kingdom of Israel, and, he's, and he had enough of it. 
And he used the prophet Amos to warn them about the coming Assyrian exile that would eventually overtake Israel in the, in the year 722 B.C. On that dreadful day, no one would escape God's presence. No one. doesn't matter where they go. Even if they climb up to, the, to heaven or dig their way into hell or, or hide in mountains, doesn't matter. God's presence would be there to cut them down. Now, you would think, I mean, I would think, that Amos is preaching and prophesying would have been enough to get their attention and get the Israelites to stop and think about what they were doing, right? Wouldn't you? I mean, I, I personally would if it was me. I would think I would. I mean, you think a, a warning like this will cause everyone to instantly repent and get on their knees and renew their faith in God. I mean, you would think that a clear exposition of God's omnipresence like this would keep them on their toes and keep them accountable. Well, that's not how it turned out. How about for us? John Wesley, the founder of Methodism, drives the, this point home in his powerful sermon on the omnipresence of God. He says this, If you believe that God is about your bed and about your path and spies out all of your ways, then take care and, and do not do the least thing, do not speak the least word, do not indulge in the least thought which you have reason to think would offend him. Imagine that a messenger of God, an angel, would be now standing at your, at your right hand and fixing his eyes upon you. Would you not take care to abstain from every word or action that you think might offend him? Or suppose one of your fellow servants, suppose a holy man stood, stood by you. Would you not be extremely cautious in how you conduct yourself, both in word and action? Well, how much more? How much more cautious ought you to be when you know full well that not a holy man and not an angel, but God himself, the Holy One, the one who inhabits eternity, is inspecting your heart, your tongue, your hand at every moment, and that he himself will surely bring, bring you, you into judgment for all you think, speak, and act. Remember, God is holy. That, that is something to celebrate, not something to be afraid of. A.W. Tozer said that he, he said, I'd rather go to hell than to go to heaven with a God who compromises with sin. But if you really believe in, the, in God's omnipresence, how would it change what you do? Because you remember, remember, God's presence is a good thing. Don't let, don't let the God's judgment scare you off. When the Bible talks about God's presence, it almost always speaks of it as a blessing. And the more we rid, rid ourselves of sin, the closer we walk with God through His Son, Jesus Christ, the more we're able to know and experience God and, and be filled with joy. The Bible says in Psalm 16, verse 11, you make known the path of life. In your presence is the fullness of joy. That's quite a statement, isn't it? Is it true or isn't it true? Is it half true? Is it whole true? In, his, in your presence is the fullness of joy. Yes, bringing, being aware of God's presence brings conviction, but it also brings us great joy. You know, what causes conversion is not only the, the removal of the consciousness of sin, but even more, what causes conversion is a, is a conscious presence of God revealed in, revealed in the human heart. Don't you remember Adam? He walked with God every morning. Every morning they walked, and all of a sudden, he's hiding one day. God comes down and says, Adam, where art thou? Do you think God didn't know where Adam was? Adam didn't know where Adam was. It's the, it's the human heart, and only the human heart, that puts distance between us and God. But in his presence, there is fullness of joy. So I encourage you, let God's all-consuming presence convict you and console you, and yours will be a joy that is, that is full. Let God's all-consuming presence convict, convict you and console you, and yours will be a joy that is full. God is everywhere. You can't confine him to a box. And his omnipresence does console us in times of need and keeps us on our toes throughout all of life. And as we close, I just want to ask, have, it, have we grown 
used to the, uh, the fact of divine remoteness? Have we just learned to live with it? A.W. Tozer said that humans invent every sort of entertainment to, to try to, to get them to forget, that, forget that they are without God. Have you learned to be content with a sense of divine remoteness? It doesn't have to be that way. You can take action. You can first do two things. First, you could you could start each day by being intentional to acknowledge the reality that God's right there with you, right there in your midst. You know that, that's what seeking God really looks like. You know, and the truth is, is only humble people seek after God. So don't don't shy away from God's conviction. Tozer said, God wants to be wanted. You can see God from anywhere if your mind is set to love and obey him. And second, choose a verse that, that talks about God's presence and focus on it throughout the entire week. God's presence is what makes the difference between a, a prayer meeting and a, and a dance recital. God's presence. Will you bow your heads in a word of prayer with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you for um, that we get to have your presence. Lord, we don't know what's going to happen in the days ahead. We don't know what's going to happen in our culture or, or our well-being. But Lord, one thing we do know is that you'll be with us, Lord, right there with us, Lord. And Lord, I, I thank you, Lord, um, for that promise, Lord. It's glorious. And Lord, I pray that every single person here would have joy that is full. And Lord, I pray for those here that may, might not know you or those listening. I pray that they recognize, Lord, that the distance between them and God is one of, you know, of character. And, and moral conduct, Lord. I, I pray, Lord, that um, that we'd all know that God is not far from any one of us at any time, Lord. I pray, Lord, um, that we would learn how to practice your presence and learn how to draw near to you and, and to um, just cooperate with you when you uh, point things out in our lives that are hindering us from experiencing your omnipresence to the full. And I pray that we'd enjoy our Christian walks, that we learn to enjoy them. In Jesus' name, amen.